that's part of the problem that we we have now with our our current civilization you know has begun has become sort of locked into this paradigm of economic growth uh, which we know on a on a finite planet is is just not possible so <laughs> and we know that all other organisms and species you know grow for a while and then they they uh, they level off and and they can continue to develop um you know and become become better at what they do uh, but material growth, you know, beyond a certain uh, beyond a certain limit, uh, it, it's just not it's just not in the cards. We are in a multi crisis, you know, situation, uh, but in a sense that creates an opportunity uh, to to make these these kinds of changes. You know, once it, once we recognize that, hey, you know, we we are hitting rock bottom. <laughs> you know, we've got to, we've got to try something different. And simply trying to get back on the band on the same treadmill that we were on before, uh, you know, I think it's becoming more and more obvious to people that that's not the solution. As Dana Meadows has has pointed out, you know, what's really important is to provide the vision, and then let the path kind of reveal itself. That's what's going to be needed to it to really engage uh, the general public um, in this process and to get them on board and and enthusiastic about uh, trying to achieve that vision. Because it has to be more than just, you know, we don't like what we have. It's got to be, here's what we want. You know, here's, here's what we're trying to create. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with uh, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, how our societies consume uh, and emit emissions, and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just, context-specific and systemic way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and today we'll have an in-depth discussion about our addiction, our society's addiction to economic growth. Uh, how did we get addicted to growth? How did we get addicted to a concept such as GDP, whereas the creator of that concept warned us that we shouldn't use it to value our economic prosperity. We had many warnings over the years. We've known the problems. We even know the solutions. And yet we don't manage to move ahead. So what is wrong? What is stopping us from moving ahead? There are some underlying problems with that addiction that we need to address if we want to move forward. To discuss about this addiction and how to get out of it, I'm very, very happy to speak with uh, Robert Katanza. Uh, Bob is Professor of Ecological Economics at the Institute for Global Prosperity at the University College London. His uh, transdisciplinary research integrates the study of humans and the rest of nature to address research, policy, and management issues at multiple time. You probably know his work already. Uh, he has contributed to the development of very, very important concepts such as the valuation of ecosystem services, planetary boundaries. Uh, so you you already have read his work, even if you don't know it. <laughs> his latest book is called Addicted to Growth, Societal Therapy for a Sustainable Wellbeing Future that just came out. And I want to take this time with you, Bob, to perhaps present a bit yourself and also your work. And to start us off, I want to, to jump in with your backstory because you studied architecture at the very beginning and then you jumped in systems ecology. How, how do, does an architect become interested by you know, this vast scale and theory of systems ecology? Yeah, well, I, I was fortunate, I think, to be in an architecture program. Um, I started actually in engineering and I thought there was that was a little too cut and dried, and I wanted something a little more creative. So architecture seemed to be a good compromise. Um, and uh, during that that program, I got involved with some professors who were working with uh, Howard Odom uh, on a project um, trying to understand the patterns of land use change in um, in South Florida. And um, <clears throat> my master's thesis, actually, in in um, in the architecture department, was preparing. A series of land use maps for the Kissimmee Everglades Basin in, in Florida, just to see how things had changed over that time period and trying to explain, you know, why and how they changed and what the future might might hold. Uh, so <clears throat> that was really a kind of landscape ecology 
uh, program or, or thesis much as much as a uh, an architecture uh, thesis. And it was certainly had to do with with urban planning and those sorts of issues as well. And as part of that, I got I fortunately got involved in the project that was ongoing uh, with with HT Odom, uh, looking at that that system over time, and and my PhD uh, dissertation had to do with how that South Florida land use had changed and how how energy flowed through these kind of economic and ecological systems, and of course that was all about how systems function, not just mm -hmm. you know economies, not just societies, not just the environment, but how the the whole system. You know what that you look at from from space. Uh, you look at planet Earth. You know it's a it's a highly integrated uh, system. So and uh, and the ideas there were that you know you can't understand these pieces of the system without understanding the context and the the rest of the system that they're they're embedded in. So you know from that this idea of an ecological economics uh, sort of was a natural a natural out outflow that uh, really got started I think more when I moved to my first job at uh, Louisiana State University uh, and with uh, and became colleagues with uh, Herman Daly, who was on the mm -hmm. economics faculty there, and several other colleagues who were studying, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, coastal, uh, coastal land use and coastal ecology. Uh, so, and from there, it, <laughs> it continued. But I think ever since it's been, you know, how do we understand these complex systems? And how do we make um, how do we how do we use that knowledge really to make a better future? It's not just understanding where we are, uh, but and where and where we seem to be headed. But could we go to a a better future? Yeah, and I think um, as as you mentioned it, you you have several components which are essential uh, when you study any system that you learned back in those days, and that probably you have taken um, for ecological economics as a general field, right? I mean, yeah. you, you talked about space, you talked about time. What are some of the key components that you, well, now use every day since your, you know, your original studies of the wetlands and and these uh, yeah. ecosystems? Well, I think one of the one of the key elements in understanding systems is how does energy flow through these systems? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all dependent on, on, uh, on, on energy. Uh, in, in some way, and really, they're about converting energy and and uh, you know sort of creating ordered structures um, to, to, uh, as part of the system. So this whole idea of urban metabolism, I think, fits fits quite well into that. And thinking of cities, you know, not just as built infrastructure, but thinking of them as as complex systems, just like any other ecosystem. Uh, they just happen to have you know a dominant species that happens to build the kind of structures that that we build, uh, you know. But it's it's uh, you know in in essence not not completely different from from any other ecosystem uh, once you look at those those basic <clears throat> fundamental similarities uh, so um, and and trying to understand uh, also uh, how these systems evolve and uh, you know some of the problems that that uh, that species can run can run into so there can be you know lock-in species go extinct all the time uh, because conditions change and they're not able to adapt. Uh, quickly enough, they get locked into a particular mode of behavior, and I think um, that's that's part of the problem that we we have now with our our current civilization. You know, has begun has become sort of locked into this paradigm of economic growth, uh, which we know on a on a finite planet is is just not possible. So, <laughs> and we know that all other organisms and species, you know, grow for a while and then they. They uh, they level off and and they can continue to develop, um, you know, and become become better at what they do, uh, but material growth, you know, beyond a certain uh, beyond a certain limit, uh, it, it's just not it's just not in the cards. So <clears throat> I think it's really uh, it's really crazy <laughs> that that at least some economists, you know, have and politicians have gotten locked into this idea that that growth can continue indefinitely. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we need to, to to sort of recognize the the, uh, the fallacy there, and <clears throat> and uh, and show people that there is a better way. We don't have to have a growing economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the vast majority of human history, we didn't have growing economies mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in the first place, and um, and and that's not really the goal anyway. The goal is you know to have a, a high quality of life that's that's equitably shared uh, for for everyone, and also 
uh, you know, to to protect the rest of nature, not just the uh, the human part, uh, but but all the other parts of our spaceship that we that we depend on. So <laughs> it's funny because you said most of the economists, well, would think another way, and you you and some other colleagues are a different species of economist, uh, the ecological economist. Um, I had the pleasure to to talk with a number of them through the podcast. I mean, Herman. Uh, before he passed away, and uh, Marina Fischer-Kowalski, Juan Martinez Ayer, mm -hmm. a number of people who who come also from different disciplines, right? They're not economists mm -hmm. by training per se. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the richness of it. And I think perhaps that's what you managed to depict, the, the inter or transdisciplinarity of economics, thanks to that, no? Right. And ecological economics is, was not designed as a discipline. You know, it's designed as a, a transdiscipline, uh, recognizing that, that we have to look at the whole system. I mean, we could have called it systems economics or, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> something different, but ecological <clears throat> seemed to imply that we have to think of the economy as part of the broader ecosystem. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and also, it's, it's not like we're trying to create uh, something that's um, totally distinct from all of the existing disciplines. We want to utilize the knowledge that's already there, uh, but bring it together and integrate it in a more effective way. And uh, and recognize <laughs> the basic fundamental rule that all models are wrong, you know, but some are useful. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. really about creating useful models that will help us create a, a better world. And I think the the standard mainstream economic model which was useful for a time there, I think, uh, but you know has really become uh, counterproductive, uh, if, you know, in some of its some of its assumptions. Uh, so we need to create a better, more useful model that we can uh, that we can use. But but still, being humble enough to recognize that you know that that model itself is also not complete, at least, and not not wrong, and and uh, be able to adapt and learn and change. So it's. It's really about creating a, a, a framework that allows you know new knowledge uh, to to come in and be incorporated. Yeah, perhaps can can we provide uh, some um, diagnosis uh, by using this uh, model or framework, or what are the main key insights? Well, I think the society was built in eighty nine or something like that, so yeah, it's been yeah. thirty five years or so. Yeah. So, <laughs> what you and your colleagues have distilled uh, in these well, there, years. I mean, there are some basic fundamental facts, I guess that that I think I think are hard to uh, are hard to refute uh, that that we're we're structured around. And the first is that we do live in this interdependent system. That the economy is embedded within society, which is embedded within the rest of nature. And uh, you know, we can't look at those those subsystems independently. We have to think of their interactions, especially now in in the Anthropocene epic, as it's been called, uh, recognizing that the activities of, of humanity are having a major impact on how our life support system functions. So we can't just assume that you know, nature will take care of itself and, and will absorb you know, all of the, the waste that we produce and continue to function you know, as, it, as it always has. Uh, because because our activities are are, um, are are much more impactful these days, so we have to take that into into account, um, and I think that changes things. You know, we're not in an empty world any longer, as 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 Herman Daly has said. We're in a full world. We're in you know uh, we're we're um, approaching or exceeding planetary boundaries. Uh, you know, in, in several key areas. You know, we are affecting the climate. The climate is changing, and and uh, and many other things. So. I think that's the that's the key uh, the key aspect, and I think there's also the uh, the fundamental goals that we're trying to achieve uh, are are a bit different uh, from the conventional view, you know, which assume that you know the more we produce and consume, the better off people are going to be. Um, yeah, you know, all else being equal, that's that's probably okay. But the problem is, all else is not equal, and this. You know, yeah. addiction to growth is now having a lot of negative side effects. It's actually leading us to uh, to disaster, essentially. So I think that's the other uh, key element is that we have to get beyond this addiction to growth and recognize how consumption uh, contributes to well-being and and when it doesn't, and what other things also contribute to well-being. Community, you know, interaction with nature, 
uh, the whole spectrum of basic human needs that that need to be fulfilled for people to lead a, a satisfying uh, life. That's that's also sustainable, you know. So we also have to understand the long term implications of of what we're doing. You know, it may be fine today, but if it's something that that's not sustainable, <laughs> then that's not so good either. Uh, so it has to be both sustainable and desirable. And I think those are the that's the other the, the other key elements. What does that world look like? And I think if you get back to the uh, addiction metaphor, uh, you know what one of the therapies that seems to work quite quite well uh, with in overcoming addic overcoming addiction is something called uh, motivational interview, as I talk about in the in the book, uh, which does not confront addicts you know with their problem, but instead uh, engages them in a discussion of their life goals. You know what are they trying to achieve, and so by analogy. And that's what is is necessary, really, to motivate the kinds of difficult changes that that are needed, both in overcoming addictions, in in changing business practices, and you know, in achieving anything difficult. I think it really is important to have a clear shared goal, uh, and I think that's what's that's what's missing right now is that that broadly shared alternative uh, to to a, a growing GDP kind of world. There's some you know significant progress in that direction, you know, with the UN Sustainable Development Goals process, I think is a, you know, kind of the first time in human history that all the countries in the world have agreed on a set of goals that are, that are much broader than, than simply GDP growth. Uh, and, and yet, um, you know, progress toward achieving those goals is, is, uh, is not as fast as, as we would really want either. So how do we broaden that engagement and get, you know, the rest of the, the world uh, to to understand that there is a there is a, a different way there is a different world that that uh, that could be better more sustainable a steady state but uh, you know but one that that really does provide sustainable well being and I think I mean the the vision is what what you mentioned being the most important we're going to spend some time on it I think as you mentioned so there is this societal addiction and as you write in the book for an addiction. We first need to know that it's harmful for us. There's the knowledge part, yeah. and then we also need to seek short-term reward, uh, rewards where we, when we know that it's unsustainable on the long run, right? So, I think before we we spend some more time on how to overcome this addiction, what's made us? I mean, we talk about the great acceleration, right? But uh, what were some components that made us? Uh, well get in this societal trap in this in this trap that yeah okay now gdp is our only uh holy uh, <laughs> the holy indicator. grail right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well i mean the history of it comes i mean gdp was only invented really in the in the 30s you know during the great depression and really formalized at the end of world war ii at the at the brenton woods conference um so it's not it's not uh, you know, gospel in any sense. It's something that that we created <laughs> to try and understand how you know the economy produces marketed goods and services, uh, and it's sort of limited limited to that. And and you know, by many accounts, it was critical uh, for the Allies, you know, to win World War II, uh, to have this this concept of GDP because we had to produce guns and boats and. You know, weapons faster than than uh, than the Axis, and and we did. And, and that was used <laughs> as an argument to actually produce, or, or what was it? I think it was Roosevelt that said we, if we do the statistics, we have ten percent and something like that. So it's we're okay. We can produce yes. and go to war. Right, right, yeah. right. <laughs> we can win this war. We can crank out you know enough <laughs> enough uh, material, and so it you know that was it was essential uh, for that for that purpose. Um, you know, <clears throat> and at, at, in the, at Bretton Woods, you know, the Allies uh, designed the World Bank and the IMF and and other mechanisms to sort of stabilize those uh, those economies uh, and and the international trade process, and you know, and saw that GDP. Okay, we need to measure how big these economies are, and that that was one one of the best ways to do it. But as you know, as Simon Kuznets and, and others, you know, at the time, the architects of GDP warned, you know, okay, this is for measuring marketed economic activity, but it's not me measuring welfare. Uh, at best, it's measuring income, and it's not even measuring sustainable income. It's measuring 
just marketed activity. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, how we got uh, in mind that that was the only thing <laughs> or the main thing. I mean, after World War II, there was a lot of rebuilding that had to go on. And so that, you know, the, the built capital and uh, economic activity like that was probably the limiting factor in improving people's lives. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that now uh, the limiting factor has become you know, our natural capital and our social capital, the other things that affect affect well-being uh, that are now being negatively impacted by all of that, that GDP growth. And, you know, in the same sense that, you know, an addict, when you first start taking the drug, it's great. You know, you have all the positive, positive things that yeah. the drug produces. And it's only later that you see the the negative repercussions, you know, that that it has on your body, on your lifestyle, on, on a whole range of your social interactions, et cetera. So I think we're in that sort of analogous situation. Um, <clears throat> the fossil fuel sector is certainly a, a, a complicit in this in this addiction metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, because yes, the great acceleration was largely fueled by fossil fuels, uh, <clears throat> especially oil. Uh, and so that increased our ability to to produce, you know, built infrastructure uh, dramatically. <clears throat> uh, but it also had the, the negative side effects on on climate, on on the rest of the environment, et cetera. And those negative side effects were known, you know, by the fossil fuel sector early on. There's a lot of evidence that's just coming out now uh, that they <laughs> they predicted, you know, global global warming much better and much more accurately than than some of the scientists uh, were doing at the at the time. Uh, so, you know, it's been uh, the the pusher, you know, being complicit in this process and knowing that that these these uh, the drugs are are producing negative effects, uh, but but continuing because it has positive feedbacks on their their bottom line. So, <laughs> and you make the parallel with uh, the tobacco industry as the well. The tobacco industry did exactly the same thing. And in fact, it's it's true that many of the same you know advertising <laughs> uh, agencies that were working for tobacco are now working for fossil fuels. You know, to try to to try to muddy the waters and <laughs> and uh, and uh, buy politicians and and etc. So, <clears throat> those are all part of the reasons that we. We haven't made the progress that we that we should have been making mm. over the last couple of decades, um, you know, specifically on climate. But I think it's also true on a lot of other a lot of other fronts, uh, having to do with redistribution of wealth and and uh, and and management and of the uh, the natural environment in in several different ways. Yeah, and I think um, I really enjoy this uh, this notion of societal trap. I mean, investment traps. Or you know, sunk uh, sunk cost fallacy, something that we understand in terms of, you know, fossil fuel assets. Yeah. But we can also see it more broadly as a society that we think we have too much to lose by exiting this growth paradigm, or I don't know what it is, but we we're really, uh, and you mentioned it further down ahead. It's not just changing the individual. Um, behaviors and practices it's it's much more than that we need a cultural societal shift right. in order to get out of this trap right, right right yeah and overcoming these investment traps you know is is admittedly difficult so it's not surprising really that that and, and often people think well you know we know what we have to do why why aren't we doing it well <laughs> i think this is an explanation for for why not and it and it occurs in a lot of different contexts as I said, you know, I talked about the dollar auction game, which is a really interesting <laughs> phenomenon. I don't know if you re read about that in the in the book, but uh, yeah, yeah. But please, uh, yeah. Uh, you can uh, you can say it here as well. <laughs> I think people would be interested. So you know, it turns out you can auction off a dollar for much more than a dollar uh, in 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 almost any crowd, uh, and the only difference is that the highest bidder and the second highest bidder have to both pay the auctioneer. Whereas only the highest bidder gets the prize, so when one bidder is at ninety-five cents and the other bidder is at a dollar, the guy at ninety-five cents says, "Well, if I raise to a dollar five, you know, I only lose five cents. Uh, if I drop out, I lose ninety-five cents. It's rational to raise, <laughs> to bid more than a dollar for a dollar, and that process will continue, you know, up to ridiculous heights in, in the experiments that have been done, uh, and that's because people people feel like they're they're invested in, uh, you know, the, the the process. They've 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 invested so much uh, that they have to justify that that investment by uh, by continuing. 
So it kind of explains arms races. It explains, you know, the the uh, the continuance of the neoclassical economic paradigm. <laughs> it explains, I think, a lot of a lot of things that we should have changed, uh, but but haven't, uh, just because we're we're sort of invested in, locked in, you know, addicted to uh, the the uh, the current the, the current behavior. And you have to sort of be able to step outside of that and and see the process. I think. Uh, for for what it is, in order to uh, to build a, a therapy, I think in this indeed of we need to zoom out or step outside of this box that we've created in order to to change stuff. And you also mentioned that we need to to change the the actual rules and incentives that set the trap in the first place, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. we, we cannot work along uh, by just mere improvement or enhancing what we have. We need to change the entire structure, and yeah, and I think that I think of it, yeah. Sorry, no, I think it gets back to changing the fundamental goals that the system is trying to pursue, you know. And and often people think, well, uh, it's individual behavior that we have to change. You know, mm. if everybody stopped eating so much meat, if everybody stopped flying, if everybody stopped driving so much, you know, uh, stopped consuming uh, as much as they do, uh, <clears throat> it would all be good. So it's really up to us as individuals to change, but. You know we're we're stuck in the context of the system and so people can't change their behavior you know as much as 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 they would like as they, they want to 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 do just because they're you know they have to go to work they have to make money they have to they're they're stuck in the system so you have to change the system in order to allow, enable people to change their behavior in the way that that is needed uh, <clears throat> how do you change the system that's that's the uh, that's the key element. How do these systems transform themselves? And I think that's going to take a, a change in in fundamental goals. And to do that is going to take a political process that involves you know the the larger uh, larger civil society recognizing that the kind of world that we want is not the kind of world that we're we're in or that we're we're headed towards. And certainly that's happened several times in the past. You know there've been revolutions. Mm. Um, the the problem is have getting a revolution that's positive that actually leads to a better state uh, that doesn't have a, a uh, you know that doesn't require a violent transition but but it's something that's more uh, that's more more equitable and more smooth and that's that's I think uh, totally possible as well um, and the surveys that have been done you know people around the world I think show that the vast majority of people would like the kind of world that the SDGs represent. They would like a world that's more, much more equitably distributed, where wealth is much more equi equitably distributed. They would like a world where climate is stable. They would, they would like all of those things. They would like to have a future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would indeed. like to have a, a sustainable future for the for their children. So it's not that people like where we're headed. It's quite the contrary. Uh, so the I think the challenge is well, how do you consolidate that movement? How do we get to that tipping point? You know where that uh, where that worldview and that desire for that kind of world is is uh, becomes becomes the dominant vision, and uh, we can use that to to uh, to overcome this this addiction in the same analogous way that you know if an addict can really establish their their life goals, uh, that's enough to or that that can help to motivate these these changes. It's that motivation that's that's uh, that's still missing, and it has to come from that the shared vision. And also, I think there is some myths that need to be deconstructed. I mean, we'll get later into that as well. But, you know, the, the strategy of the commons that we're a bit doomed and uh, and humans are not capable of taking care of the planet and things like that. I think, yeah. once again, you don't know whether it's the fossil fuel lobby <laughs> that kind of pushed that into us or there is something more to it than, than this. Yeah. Well, it, and if we want to go on that down that route, I, I think uh, I think. The tragedy of commons really is the tragedy of open access to uh, to commute to common resources, you know. And as Eleanor Ostrom has pointed out, uh, lots of uh, societies have designed um, institutions that effectively manage commons um, in a in a way that's sustainable and that and that provides well being for the for the whole community. So it's certainly not impossible, but it does require. Uh, that we establish property rights, you know, over those those assets, but they have to be community rights rather than than private rights. So we've actually <clears throat> recommended, you know, that we think of the atmosphere as a community asset and establish 
property rights on behalf of the whole population. And then, you know, who, whoever damages that property has to pay pay for those damages. So it provides an institutional framework for uh, for charging for, for carbon emissions. Instead of thinking of it as a market, you think of it as a, a common asset that we're we're managing and and protecting and and charging for damages to in the same way that we would charge for damages from an oil spill um, and then use that use that income uh, to undo the damages to compensate people who are affected uh, you know to to make the transformation to renewable energy that much quicker and you know those damages are largely going to fall on the fossil fuel sector um, so I think that's it's also a way of of uh, reducing their influence and in, in income uh, and ability to to sort of hold back the transition that that uh, that needs to happen. Um, but these this idea of common asset trusts, I think, can be applied at a lot of different uh, levels. You know, from from mm -hmm. watersheds, you know, to um, the oceans and and the atmosphere, and and we're certainly working on on uh, on those sorts of institutional. Uh, arrangements, <clears throat> you know. Um, so, and it, and like Peter Barnes said in his book, Capitalism 3.0, we need a whole common sector in the economy or a much expanded common sector uh, that that can uh, manage these kinds of of, uh, of resources that that natural capital and social capital represent. Yeah, I mean, we can discuss um, on the. Well, the governance aspect of it is like a sociocracy and how we need to um, better go well govern flows, govern stocks and all of this. I think one important element that you have included here and I've read in many surveys is that a number of people are ready to change if there is some sense of just the transition, yeah. uh, elements of fairness, elements of equity. Um, and I think in a number of, and, and you presented uh, the cases of Sweden, of South Africa, where in order to de-escalate and to move ahead into a very, uh, well, out of a big tension, sometimes you can resolve it by accepting one or the others, uh, the other one point of view. You need somehow to, to find a common ground, a consent yeah. of a few, of a, well, collaborative future. Sometimes. Yes. And that's the building a shared vision, um, you know, uh, process, I guess. Um, and and it doesn't have to mean you know complete consensus. Uh, you don't have to agree have to agree on everything, uh, but I think it's a search for what are the what are the common elements uh, that that everyone um, at least can consent to. And and I talked in the book a little bit about this idea of sociocracy, which which is you know how do you how do you govern the society uh, in a way that that is uh, is for the the benefit of the majority, uh, and if you did a you know just a majority voting rule, uh, off, then you have forty nine percent of the population is dissatisfied with whatever the decision is, and and they'll often then work to do everything they can to get back to fifty one percent, and then change the whole thing, um, you know, back to to something else. So you get this oscillating and polarized kind of kind of uh, political system. Um, <clears throat> And and you also have politics these days. You know, democracies are not really democratic. Uh, you know, they're uh, since they're controlled by special interests uh, far too much. And so the idea of deliberative democracy has um, also been suggested that that in fact a lot of our key decisions should be made by citizens' assemblies, that where the, the representatives are are more are randomly selected rather than. And um, you know, voted in, so that they they can't be influenced by uh, by special interests, and those sorts of citizens assemblies. You know, if they're allowed to deliberate, bring in experts, etc., they come to very reasonable and acceptable decisions. You know, to the to the majority of the of the population. Uh, so we, I think, we do need to redesign our our governance systems uh, going forward. You know, it's been said that. Especially if people are affected by the decisions, right? Yeah. If they're the, the primary beneficiaries or on the opposite, uh, well, that will be inflicted by the policies. Right, right. And, the, you know, there's studies that show that, that in fact, um, the, the will of the people, the, the, uh, the policies and decisions that the majority of people wanted are not the things that, that happen in most democracies. It's the will of the special interests that, that actually happened. Uh, so, you know, 
democracy is a good idea and I think we ought to try it. <laughs> yeah, it could be nice. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned it, that there is an obvious interest from well, some stakeholders to, to not change, right? I mean, that the system remains in change. So as a scientist, of course, we, we always get to measure the flows and then optimize them and then find solutions. And then we're like, but the solutions are here. Why they're not? And, and then a political economist will come next to you and will tap you on the shoulder and tell you, <laughs> well, it's because they're, they're actors and they're vested interests. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and how to overcome those vested interests, I think, is is mm -hmm. the is the challenge. But it's got to come from um, you know the rest of civil society uh, <clears throat> getting on board and and forcing forcing their hand essentially. And, and like an addiction, it's difficult. <laughs> so you can't yeah. expect it to be, oh, yeah, once we've pointed out that, or and even if we have the, the majority <laughs> of the population on board, like with smoking, you know, I mean, I think the majority of the population was on board with smoking is, is a problem. People should not smoke. We should not, you know, really um, encourage smoking. We should do things to, to, to limit that. Uh, <clears throat> still, you know... <laughs> Uh, it's it still uh, has taken a long time to get that message uh, really through to the uh, to the system, and it's still probably not there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's getting, getting there, there, but yeah. yeah. Um, uh, okay, perhaps we can talk about the common vision that we we should build together, right? In order to 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 get there and to agree upon and to look at the values y you say that we don't only need to build a consensus this of course but uh, we need to provide a vision that is not only coherent but also detailed enough mm. something that we can that is tangible right and i think that is important to paint a picture that is you know we can see the colors we can see the 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 people in the picture yeah. we can see the landscape we we can see everything can it, w what is this picture looking like well, I think that's where we need the arts community to to get involved <laughs> in this process, and you know we need some some films that are set in this positive vision of the future. And there are a few of them out there, but you know the majority of films about the future are really dystopic rather than than mm -hmm. utopic, and so we need to change that around. There's a film called Twenty Forty. I'm not sure if you've run across that one uh, by uh, Damon Gemmo from Australia. Uh, that's set in the near-term positive future and uh, we've been uh, we've been working with Damon to to produce some short films you know that are set in alternative visions of the future um, so that people can can get you know uh, can see the colors a bit can see the details what would life be like you know in this in this world that we're we're talking about and it becomes more than just a set of bullet points you know uh, that uh, and I think that's that's what's going to be needed to it, to really engage uh, the general public um, in this process and to get them on board and, and enthusiastic about uh, trying to achieve that vision. Because it has to be more than just, you know, we don't like what we have. It's got to be, here's what we want. You know, here's, here's what we're trying to create. You know, the bullet points are, you know, it's got to be more equitable. We have to distribute wealth and income much more equitably than it is now because it's gotten ridiculous. Uh, and so, you know, we have enough wealth and resources on the on the planet uh, to really provide for the for the whole population um, a decent quality of life. Um, but you know, we we have to. How do we do that? Well, we're going to have to increase taxes on on the wealthy uh, significantly and redistribute that income. We have to have universal basic something, whether it's income or services or you know possibilities. But there has to be a floor, you know, where where everyone is is okay, <clears throat> um, uh, and and then uh, uh, and the and the so rebuild a welfare system, uh, a net, yeah. Or, yeah, something like that. And and again, I'm not sure of, of the details, and those those details will probably be different from place to place. So it's, I don't think you can you can provide a you know like here's the path from here to from here to there because mm -hmm. we're not all at the same starting point. And probably not all at the same ending point, uh, but as Dana Meadows has has pointed out, you know what's really important is to provide the vision, and then let the path 
kind of reveal itself. You know, as long as you're focused on where you're trying to get to, uh, you know, you you can uh, you have to change the the uh, the set of the sails. You have to change your tack uh, from time to time. It's going to be you know, uh, it it may require uh, some adaptation adaptation. And this whole idea of adaptive governance and adaptive management, I think, is is key as well. You know, we can't say right now, here are the policies that are going to get us there uh, because they may not work uh, or they may not work as we plan them to. Uh, we have to say, here are some experiments we're going to try. <laughs> you know, here's our initial tack uh, on the on our sail towards the goal and uh, we'll see how it's going. You know, and if it's working, we'll stay there. And if it's not working, we have to build in the ability to uh, change tack and and to and to to move back towards the towards the goal. So, um, I think that's that's part of the problem too. That people will always come back with, well, yeah, what do we have to do right now? And what's the policy? What are the you know what are the changes? Yeah. Tell me what to do. <laughs> well, <laughs> first thing to do is to figure out where we're going. <laughs> And then once that's established, then we can go back and say, okay, are we headed in the right direction? And we, you know, and if we're not, uh, then we need to, then we need to change. Uh, and how to change, how much to change. I think that's, that's also going to be a much more participatory process. Uh, because if that comes from, you know, if that's, if that's totally top down or coming from sectors of the, of the system that they are not really representative of the, the whole population, then it's not going to work in the long run either. And we've certainly seen that before, you know, if it becomes an auto, autocratic <laughs> uh, dictatorial system, then, you know, the direction that, that, that it ends up is not, is not where people want to be. So we have more or less the, the set of coordinates, which are on the one hand, the planetary boundaries on the other one, let's say the, the social floor yeah. and, and we need to navigate in between them and, and find the, the right yeah. balance. Yeah, yeah. So the donut is a good is a good picture, I guess that that seems to resonate with people uh, that rec to recognize that there are constraints on on both ends. You know, can't get too big. We have to stay in, within planetary boundaries. We still have to supply, you know, the basics of of human needs. Uh, <clears throat> I think we need you know different terminology as well. I mean, one one term that I like is uh, the Swedish word uh, lagom which means everybody has just enough. Uh, so it's not about sacrifice. It's not about overconsumption. It's saying that, you know, we're all good. Everybody's, everybody's got just what they need and, um, and uh, not too much. Yeah, yeah, of, of course. I think th that's what's the most interesting is when you go into the granularity of it, because I was talking uh, with Kate, for instance, how do you apply the donuts model to a city? Because a city per yeah. se is an open system and lives by, you know, extracting or like a parasite somehow that that needs uh, a hinterland to function with. And what is just into a territory that still gets from outside and how do you cooperate with? And I think all of this is very interesting. And when you say enough, how do you make this illustrative because I guess your enough might be different than my enough. And, you know, I think that, yeah. Well, there are, it, there are um, and have been studies of basic human uh -huh, needs, uh -huh. you know, so, so we do know what the essentials are and, um, and, but the problem is that we've been uh, programmed also to think that there's never enough, you know, everyone is insatiable and has to have more and more and more. Um, I don't think that's, really human nature i think that's what that's what advertising has has been uh, indoctrinating people into uh, because i think the the psychology the positive psychology experiments show that people's you know community relationships social capital are at least as important as um, as their material consumption and a lot of that material consumption is really about status rather than than real need you know beyond a certain point uh, so there is a, a certain point of sufficiency. You know, you have to have enough food, enough shelter, um, you know, good health care, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> but beyond that, it's really um, other things that, that could be the main uh, components of creating well-being and not just, you know, this uh, keeping up with the Joneses and trying to consume more and more because that, and that actually has negative side effects. In fact, there's been some good studies that show that 
you know, people who are more materialistically oriented uh, are have higher rates of mental and physical illness as well, uh, because they're they're spending all their time, you know, trying to trying to uh, consume more, uh, to make more money, to, to to buy more, to you know, to sort of. Uh, so there's a good book by um, Tim Kasser called "The High Price of Materialism," <clears throat> that that gets into the details of that uh, psychological phenomena. So we know that you know people will be better off. They'll be happier. They'll be more satisfied. Uh, they have more of their basic human needs fulfilled uh, if they're you know if they're in this sufficiency mode rather than than in this I have to consume I have to constantly improve increase increase my consumption. So perhaps I, I wanted to to chat with you about uh, some layers that you include in building a vision, which are, let's say, the worldview, the build capital, the human capital, the social capital, and the natural capital. Because perhaps right. by translating it into these five layers, it might also become much more uh, tangible and and perhaps each one of us can, can see what's their place in the system, you know, or what's our role in, in this uh, mm -hmm. big picture, because it can be well nauseating when we think about yeah. such change <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's that's one way of describing what the you know a, a positive future could look like is to say well we need we need at least these four or five types of assets that are very different in their in their structure and their contribution to well-being you know so we need we need built infrastructure we need how we need housing we need transportation we need all of that stuff definitely Uh, but we need a balance between that kind of, of infrastructure and our uh, human infrastructure, individual well-being, our health, you know, our, our education, uh, the things that affect people separately as individuals. But we also need our social capital, you know, our, all of our institutions, our networks, our, both our formal and informal networks, our communities, our cultures, our governance systems, you know, everything that connects people together. I mean, the reasons that that humans have been so successful, I think, as a species is our ability to cooperate, you know, and to build these kinds of institutions and and to learn behavior that can be passed on to the to the next generation. Um, and then we also need our our natural capital, everything else in the world that we we didn't have to produce, but that supports our, our well-being in so many complex ways. So just thinking of it in that way at least gets us to recognize that it's not all about the built capital. It's not all about you know me individually. You know we got to think about uh, society. You got to think about uh, the rest of the planet. Uh, in this, and this gets back to our initial conversation about looking at the whole system and what are the what are the key pieces in that system and how do they interact with each other to produce this sustainable well-being that we're we're really trying to to produce yeah yeah i, I think I'm, i'm very glad to see that more and more studies are actually converging towards this right i mean we've had limits to growth in the 70s that were more about the planetary or the, the natural capital and the and the link with uh, the the built capital then we're now having planetary boundaries and now we're having donut economics and now the, the latest report, the Earth for All uh, report, which right. manages to, well, bring the, the historical legacy of uh, limits to growth and, and contextualize it with today's challenges, which today we were talking about inequality, we're talking about a number of elements. And I think it's very promising to, to link these challenges together. Well, what were some learnings that you got from this report, for instance, uh, and you collaborate, of course, with all of them. Yes. Uh, so I participated in that, that Earth for All uh, Club of Rome. I'm a member of the Club of Rome as well. And actually, Sandrine dixon de Cleve, who's the current co-president, wrote the, form, the foreword for the uh, Addicted to Growth book. Um, <clears throat> but I think that's that's uh, it's really an amazing um, update, I guess, of the, the ideas that were in the 1972 limits to growth with a new model that incorporates a lot of the same, these additional elements and um, and has you know a well-being indicator built into the model and looks at a couple of po po possible scenarios um, to, to sort of make the make the point that yes we can produce this this better more sustainable future 
uh, you know, with the appropriate set of, of policy changes um, around the world. So uh, it is, I think, I think, I think we're close to a tipping point. And I think that's the way these, these kinds of systems change um, that, you know, things build up over time. It doesn't look like anything's happening, but eventually, eventually there is, there is a massive change. And I think that also uh, is consistent with the, the sort of addiction metaphor you know, that people can stay in this addiction, begin to see the problems building and building, eventually say, okay, that's enough. I got to do yeah. something. <laughs> I have to do something about this and and engage in, you know, whatever therapy uh, uh, is, is necessary. And even like I'm saying that once the therapy starts, there can be, you know, drastic improvement. But we have to also be wary of of uh you know of, of a relapse and <laughs> and going back and i think some of what we're seeing in the world today are are, are kind of relapses to to uh older ways of of dealing with the problem um that hopefully will will uh, overcome and continue our our positive positive movement yeah indeed because uh now with the economic the energy and climatic crisis you know, things seems to, there seems to be no more space for adjustment. We seem to be like yeah. in a pressure cooker and there is no more room to, to figure it out anymore. It's, uh, I don't know, it, as you say, at the one hand, it's a very positive <laughs> tipping point. And on the, on the other hand, you feel that these could escalate into or spiral into something more. So yeah, I'm wondering how do you see all of the current challenges? Yeah, no, I think that's that's very much the way the way it is that uh, <clears throat> we are in a multi-crisis you know situation, uh, but <clears throat> in a sense that creates an opportunity uh, to to make these these kinds of changes. You know, once it, once we recognize that, hey, you know, we we are hitting rock bottom. <laughs> you know, we've got we've got to try something different, and simply trying to get back on the band on the same treadmill that we were on before. Uh, you know, I think it's becoming more and more obvious to people that that's not the solution. Um, so you've been part of, you know, the I IPES, uh, the Planetary Boundaries, uh, Earth for All, many of the big consortia of scientists that are trying to push the agenda and are trying to figure out novel models of understanding or concepts that help us to, you know, tease our appetites, perhaps to um, better indicate prosperity or how to change. W what is the next big thing you think that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to predict, but maybe societal therapy as a as a as a uh, <clears throat> an activity. You know, we need more more therapists <laughs> yeah. and more engagement with with the broader society. But I, like I said, I think that the 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 thing that's needed now is this shared vision. So how do we how do we create that, and how do we get the the arts community, I guess, um, more more involved in uh, in trying to to take on that that challenge um, to create pictures of the kind of world that that we all want that can uh, that can really motivate people. Yeah. So <clears throat> hopefully that that might be the next big big thing. So so. Uh, <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio, if you're watching this, you know, <laughs> call me. Yeah, <laughs> there is indeed. I mean, uh, more and more also academic focus on societal tipping points. Um, yeah. There are famous numbers about you know how much percent, what is the percent of society that needs to to change in order to to tip an entire society. I think this becomes more and more with climate activism uh, to the forefront. Um, and also in terms of uh, arts, there there are more and more uh, well activists that are at the same time filmmakers, and they say, for instance, we could do films that, as right now we see films do not have cigarettes anymore, we could imagine films that do not have cars anymore, or right. Right. you know, no pump stations anymore, or no these diesel engine cars that make a lot of noise and stuff like that. So. What do you think is a? Uh, how could we trigger some, some of these tipping points? Um, well, that's yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking about. You know, that if we had, 
if we begin to paint that picture of the, the kind of world people want, you know, because simply saying we've got to stop climate change, you know, because it's, it's going to destroy the planet. Yes. But how do you motivate enough people? How do you get enough people into the tipping point, you know, to, to get above the tipping point? I think you do that uh, more effectively with a positive vision than with a, than with a negative vision. Uh, and getting the the balance, you know, right between fear and hope, mm. I think is really the is really the challenge. And we've certainly got the fear now. <laughs> I think that's we got that. We got a handle on that. We can do fear, but <clears throat> now we need to in, increase the hope part. And I think um, that's that's certainly it's become harder to do because we can so good with the fear, but <laughs> but I think that's uh, that's the missing element at the moment. Uh, some of your inspirations into that, I think you you talk about the transition movements. Um, yeah, you talk about yeah. uh, the ministry of the future as well. Are there some some utopic uh, future scenarios that you think are very promising that we should put forward and and embrace them? Yeah, well, I like I liked Kim Stanley Robinson's book, you know, the the Ministry for the Future, because that does lay out at least a a, a feasible you know uh, scenario uh, for how how this could all happen and result in a in a positive outcome. So I think we need more of that kind of that kind of literature, that kind of film film work, etc. Um, and I also like Andrew Sims' work, you know, on um, cancel the apocalypse is one of his books uh, that basically says that all of these things that we're talking about in this quote unquote utopia, you know, are uh, are already happening somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not like they're pie in the sky. This could never happen. It's It's just, they're just not all happening in the same place at the same time. But we have a lot of feasibility tests, if you will, and models <clears throat> that we could that we could scale up uh, with. Uh, so, so that's the other thing, you know. And this, and, and back to the addiction metaphor, it's like, you know, it's not it's not like we don't know that people, you know, if they stop taking the drugs, will get will get better. We know that they, they can recover. From uh, from addictions, we know that we could produce this kind of world that we're talking about. It is feasible. It's just a question now of of, uh, of doing it. Um, perhaps to to conclude, is there something that uh, uh, how could we synthesize what we've discussed in forms of a message that you would like to to bring forward to researchers or to policymakers that might hear us or you know engage citizens? What where, where are some of the key points that we have discussed well there was a long list there but <laughs> <laughs> so understanding the system but I, right understanding the system understanding how we're how we're sort of locked in and and uh, uh we're not making progress as fast as we could and, and understanding how uh, what kind of therapy we might need to overcome this this lock-in or or addiction and getting engaged in uh thinking about what that how to build this shared vision, you know, uh, we, you know, we have the technology these days to communicate with basically everyone on the planet in real time. I mean, that has never been the case in human history before. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, we've had um, uh, small scale societies that have been actual democracies and fairly egalitarian and, and uh, you know, that, that have had common asset, Uh, resources uh, management in the Eleanor Ostrom sense. How to scale that up? Well, well, we we do have the technology that would allow that. We're not using it for that purpose. We're using it for the opposite kind of purposes these days. But we could. So I think that might be a challenge uh, for uh, the technically minded. How do we actually use uh, the communication capabilities that we have to build this to build the shared vision to build the movement that I think we need. Uh, to overcome this addiction well that's that's our focus from now onwards please uh try <laughs> to well let's find ways to to get together as well to to build this uh this vision and actually implement it so many thanks bob for this discussion and for for your book for your work <laughs> you've done so much i don't know how how much how much you can produce in one year but uh, it's always uh, quite incredible um and also thanks to thank you thanks to you everyone for listening 
uh, watching until the end. If you liked this episode, perhaps you might enjoy the other ones we did with uh, Herman Daly, with uh, K.T. Rayworth, yes. with uh, Tim Jackson. So pr probably like-minded people that, uh, that will say similar things in a different voice. So yeah, thanks again. And uh, I'll see you all in two weeks for another discussion.